Ladies and gentlemen, this is Internet Personality Evangelist, and I'm reviewing 3A's Optimus Prime from their series of very specifically licensed third-party figures from the third live-action film, Dark of the Moon. And even more specifically, this is on loan to me from Ben's Collectibles Ben, a man with a lovely accent and an irresistible beard. It's not my first 3A rodeo, but this is my first large 3A movie franchise robot rodeo, so let's see how their first Optimus Prime turned out. Based on the trilogy-refined final film-long appearance of the original movie Optimus design, 3A's sculpt is ruddy truckin' intense, capturing a massive amount of detail. Capital D dash e -tail. So much so that I find it easier to try to pick out stuff that might be missing, but then I'd need to stare at screen caps from Dark of the Moon, and I kinda don't want to. Suffice to say, the worst thing I can say about the sculpt is that there are a few large flat areas that would only have been enhanced by some physical chipping and scratching. The stance and proportions are quite natural and magnificent, as they should be given that this is a non-transforming action figure. It's still got a lot of presence regardless of its inability to convert between its hefty weight and 19 plus inches of height. And the high standard 3A paintwork comes into play hardcore on Optimus, making a lot of his plastic components look as close to beaten metal as they could hope to be through coloration alone. The metallics are intense and the use of gradients is superb. The darker muddy weathering on the gunmetal components is spot on, but the faux paint chip scratch weathering on the more colorful pieces is just not enough in my opinion. Once upon a time, 3A weathering would have legitimate tactile texture and the absence of that leaves a painful gap in my experience with this piece. Some of the faux chipping comes off alright, but a roughly equal amount looks too much like, well, silver paint applied over the blues and reds. Like I said, physical chipping would have really done something here to enhance it. On the flip side, the weathered chrome parts, like the gas tanks and hubcaps, are incredibly well rendered, and look more like actual metal than anything I've seen in person from 3A to date. Like, I'm 99% sure all those parts are plastic, but at a glance, they look anything but. By the way, one of those gas tanks houses some batteries, and guess what? So does Optimus Prime's brain. A magnet keeps his skull cap securely in place, and an included tiny stick helps reach the LED activation buttons. The headlights on either side of Optimus Prime's abs light up real nice and proper, as do his optics. Only the optic lights aren't immediately apparent, but for good reason. They are tiny, beady, piercing little bulbs, which give him an eerily lifelike gaze that suits this fully terrifying version of the live-action Autobot leader. A ball socket neck kicks us off here with some proper nodding action, proper side-side turning action, proper quizzical tilting action. It's a good ball joint. It's slightly limited in just about every respect due to the sculpt, like you can't 360 his head around without major danger. I don't know why you'd want to, but I know there are people who do. Uh, don't do that. You're weird. Down here in the torso, uh, things are also a little weird. Things are not quite the way you'd be used to stuff on a Transformers toy. This guy, everything moves, okay? So, like, these doors, they're on ball socket joints. These flaps are on ball socket joints, okay? This uh, thing down here on his abs is on a ball socket joint with a hinge, so it not only can, like, move and twist around down here, but you can also fold it up. Like, like this, because there's a his waist joint is basically one big ball socket in here. So that's how he twists at the waist, and that's also how he gets an ab crunch. And of course, to crunch his ab, you need to fold this up out of the way so it can come down over all the waist stuff. It can also tilt back a whole lot, and you put this back down there to cover the gap. Uh, there's a lot happening. Even these little doodly bopper things down here, uh, specifically called out by the instructions, these things are each on a ball socket joint so they can wiggle up and down. They can go in and out like that. I don't know why you would do that, especially on these. Everything else, I could see how it interacts with the posability, but the, those things, I don't know. A whole lot of stuff moves on here. His shoulders have got ratcheted forward and backward motion. Real beefy and tight. You can move this in, there's also a clicky butterfly joint. And, uh... It's like all this stuff moves on its own just for the sake of that much movement. Uh, if you want to move his shoulder out, there is a less clicky ratchet, and then these things can wiggle, so you can move that up to get more of that going on, and then put it back down to cover that up. There is a friction, super heavy friction bicep swivel. Rather buttery ratchet elbow with just a 90 degree range of motion. It's not double jointed despite all the stuff you're seeing there. His hands 
are on ball socket connections, really fat ball socket connections. I don't know if you can totally see that in there, but uh, it gives you a good circular range. The way that the hands work posability wise, and by that I mean the fingers, is that each finger, it's just hinges. So there's a hinge at the knuckle, and then a second hinge in the middle of the finger, then a third hinge to curl the digit. There's no spread on these hands, and I find that quite disappointing. What I find even more disappointing is they don't curl up into a very tight fist either, like that's the curl. It looks okay with the thumb down covering all that up, but it looks like a very toyetic fist, not a curled punching fist. So the finger posability on this guy I think is, is kind of a step back uh, from what I was expecting, especially for his size and price point. The thumb itself is on a ball socket joint, and then there is a hinge right above that, another hinge here and a hinge here. Those the, the ball socket connection there, I really wish that had been what the knuckles were. I should actually keep this in view, shouldn't I? So there'd be a little bit of finger spread, but as it is, there is none. And uh, it keeps his hand looking very static, no matter how many joints it has inside of it. Getting our crotch close-up going, there's, a, again, a whole lot of just moving stuff here. Outside of the usual joints, there are these little uh, blue butt flaps which are on ball socket connections. These are very easy to detach, too. They peg in via the, the gray rod back here. Uh, and they, they come off, I find, fairly frequently. Like, really easily, fairly frequently. If this wasn't my copy, and if it didn't have to go back in its box, I would be almost tempted to glue that. Um, but this also means that the blue thing can kind of get out of the way of stuff. Uh, then this tire, the, the tires here, these, these tires are on ball socket connections, as are these ones. But then these upper tires are also on a thigh slider, uh, so they can really get out of the way of stuff. Then over here on the front, if you need to get things out of the way even more, these blue bits can rotate out of the way of the hip joints. The hip joints themselves also can move, FYI. Don't want to blow your mind, but they can ratchet forward. And then as you're ratcheting them forward, like, stuff would start to bang together. So you get this out of the way, and you can ratchet it much farther forward. And then these hip joints can slide out like that, uh, to get more clearance here, and I think a little bit more clearance outwardly as well, because if you move them out, there's a more buttery outward joint, and I, I think you can get this guy to almost do like a full, there goes that flap, do a full high kick, but I, for the life of me, haven't sat down, to, there goes the other flap, haven't sat down to, to figure it all out, like these flaps, right, they, they fall off, man, I'm gonna put these back on. Further leg motion includes a thigh swivel, which is very softly detented, and then down here, these knee flaps can do the, uh, the forward-backward tango. Uh, if you like to have them pointed forward like that for some reason. I never have really liked that on Movie Prime. These are frictioned on, so they pop off pretty easily and just go back onto their little mounting nubs. If you're moving everything on this guy and it's getting kind of unwieldy, that is a thing that I found can pop off now and then. There are two ratchet joints down here on the knee. And uh, also, this block is pin-hinged to move up out of the way. The two ratchet joints do not quite make for a double jointed knee though, like that's moving them each individually and you can move them in combination, but regardless of this bit getting out of the way, you can't curl his knee all the way up. And often I find I can't use either of the joints their fullest, I mostly just get this, like this sort of 90 degrees. They together make for 90 degrees of motion. If you just use the lower one, it's a bit less than 90 and you can bring it up, or you can use the top one as much as possible and then they get like two clicks out of the bottom one. So it's it's hard for me to say that's just a straight up double jointed knee, even though it technically is. The feet are attached via gigantic ball socket joints. They're very tight. They're, uh, they're good for some forward, backward, side to side tilt. Not very much boot cut swivel. And uh, this thing is, is pinned on here so you can wiggle that. The toe can wiggle up and down. It's uh, I think just a hinge wiggle even though at a glance, it looks kind of like a ball socket joint. I find the feet, though, to be kind of disappointing. The, the ball socket ankle, it's tight. But given the size and weight of this guy, I really wish that there had been some, like, crisscross ratchet joints down in the ankles, just so I have, like, solid clicks keeping this guy steady, because I find that 3A Dark of the Moon Optimus, he's not hard to pose, but he tends to wiggle a lot and tends to kind of lean and jitter in a way that makes me a bit uncomfortable. And then with all this weight being held by just two giant ball socket joints, like they are tight joints, but a ball socket joint is something that can 
start to wear out over time, and it worries me. I wish there had been a more solid ratchet click down there in the ankles, because the knees are super heavy ratchets, the hips super heavy ratchets, the shoulders super heavy ratchets. There's like this, this, this mid-torso ball socket joint is fine, but having that down in the ankles, not so fine. Also, I'm gonna do that thing that I know is frustrating as hell to hear as a viewer of a video review, but this guy, like he may be coming off kind of unwieldy to play with. He's not. He's unwieldy to play with when there's a camera here between me and him and he's surrounded by lights that keep getting bumped by stuff like my arms when I'm trying to mess with him in a way that's still viewable on camera. If you just play with this thing by yourself, in a non-presentational format, he's not that hard to mess with. All the moving parts all over the place, as intimidating as they come off at a glance, they're not. They're really helpful at getting out of the way of stuff. It's just those butt flaps that are actually frustrating. Everything else is quite natural and just sort of bumps out of the way and doesn't feel like it's gonna fall off. The butt flaps are a weakness in an otherwise like super rigid, super solid, baby shakeable toy. And this isn't even my copy, so this is, apologies, Ben. I'm not going to throw him at the backdrop. I'm just showing that he can he can take a few few wiggles, put him down. And Bob is your father's brother, which is your uncle. Optimus Prime includes a few bonus battle bits, and the smallest of the bunch is his bladed knuckle duster. It slips on over his knuckle and makes me wish he could ball up a bit of a better fist. Also, it only attaches to his left knuckle, and the L sculpted on the underside of the piece makes me wonder if a right-hand version ever got tooled up. The main weapon event are these twin forearm swords, which feature connector cover slips that are fully sculpted and fully painted for no discernible reason. I guess you could use them as handles if you want him to hold the swords in his hands, but why would you? The swords jam straight into the slots inside a prime's sleeves and hold in there hardcore solidly. The energy blades use some frosted paint over translucent plastic to try to give off a glowy effect, and I don't know if the extra paint is helpful or a hindrance. Like, at least the orange part isn't weathered as well. But I feel like a lack of paint would have only made it seem more... laser-like. Finally, exclusive to Optimus Primes that were ordered off of 3A's Bambaland vendor site, comes this big stonkin' blaster. It is heavily detailed and delightfully painted. It's also fat enough to look like an actual small 1 to 1 scale pistol in my fleshy hands. In Prime's hands, it totally looks the part, and thank goodness there's a peg on either side of the handle to fasten directly into the holes on Optimus Prime's palms. See, for years my biggest 3A engineering gripe has been the number of toys that try to use the strength of their finger joints alone to hold onto their weapons. Often that strength ain't really enough. So damn if a handle connection on a 3A toy isn't an effing sight for effing sore effing eyes. I hope this isn't the last time I see one of these on this company's wares. As for Optimus Prime, he's the second to last figure in 3A's Dark of the Moon lineup, with Starscream finishing the series right after him. And man, he is a solid piece of titanic high-end Cybertronian action figure! This guy was delayed for mass articulation enhancement retooling, and is by far one of the most hefty and playable large-scale 3A pieces I have messed with in years. The ratchets are strong and plentiful, and the figure evokes a confident and durable hand-feel sensation whenever I mess around with them. I'm glad to say that I've had to cut deep to find most of my gripes between the disappointing lack of ratchets in the ankles and the wholly unspreadable, unfistable fingers. And for all the hardcore visual quality, I often find myself wondering what a 2010-era 3A paint job would have looked like, and more importantly, what it would have felt like. Also, with this guy hitting brutal high-end price points that often clear the 400 US dollar mark, I wish there were a few more accessories. Especially since the gun isn't included if you miss the Bambalan pre-order window. This is a very niche collectible for the heavy of wallet, but 3A's Movie Optimus swings a hard ball game by bringing an imposing and playable experience on the back of his impressive visual presentation. Most of you will probably not even consider picking one up, but if you're in the specific demographic of people who are ready to knuckle down into this particular deep end, rest assured that as a toy, this piece is legit. It will survive some goddamn playtime. Anyway, this has been Internet Personality Evangelist, and I want to give shouts out to 3A and Ben S Collectibles for all the arrangements that allowed me to handle and review this piece. Also, shouts out to myself, because this was a frigging hard thing to get back to my apartment after TFCon. <laughs>